think this day is getting more interesting uh, as it continues, and I'm really grateful for that excellent uh, lecture. I would now like to introduce a second person who you had a chance to get to know briefly this morning, uh, but unfortunately it was very limited uh, due to the time limitations for the panel discussion. So I look forward to the chance to get a more in-depth uh, reflection and also perspective uh, on cultural diplomacy in the EU from Ms. Anna-Marie Nettes Utebrook. She's a member of the European Parliament, uh, although initially it was actually a French teacher. Uh, after that, she also worked as a press officer for the Minister of Justice, also regional councillor for Brussels uh, as a leader of the Flemish Liberal Party. She also served as a minister in the Brussels government, state secretary for foreign affairs, deputy foreign minister for European affairs, and co-president of the Federal Commission on International Dialogue. She retains honorable distinctions in Belgium as the commander in the Ordre de Léopold in France, as a knight in the Ordre National de la Légion d'Honneur in Senegal, as the Grand Officer in the Ordre National de Lyon, and in Bulgaria as the Foy de Laurier d'Or. She currently serves as member of the European Parliament and is a member of the following delegations, Committee on Foreign Affairs, Subcommittee on Security and Defense, and the Delegation for Relations with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. The lecture topic that she has chosen today is the significance of cultural diplomacy in the foreign affairs of the EU. Please join me for a second welcome for uh, Ms. Anna-Marie Nettes Utebrock. Thank you. So good afternoon uh, again. Good afternoon for the first time, but hello again. As, uh, uh, I was here this morning uh, as well. Um, actually, the, 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 the core elements of my reflection on, on the role of, cultural, of culture in the diplomacy uh, of the uh, European Union uh, have already been expressed this morning in, in uh, my, my short intervention, so I, I will we trace that and, and develop those reflections uh, uh, a little bit uh, further. Um, it's also important to uh, remember that I, I said that when the European Union originated in the beginning, uh, this was not uh, about culture, this was not about language, this was mainly about uh, rebuilding a, a continent devastated by uh, a terrible war and uh, a continent that had known uh, wars for, for several centuries and two particularly devastating ones in the first half of the last century and in which uh, two times uh, almost the entire world had been engulfed and so uh, the main uh, priority was to, to prevent the repetition of that and it was thought uh, that the, the bringing together of especially uh, those industries uh, that had fueled wars in the, the 19th century and the 20th century uh, might be one way to do it and this is how uh, the, the community of coal and steel was uh, established between uh, the six founding member states, being the three Benelux countries, uh, that had quite a long history of cooperation, uh, and uh, the former enemies, uh, France, uh, Italy, and, and Germany. And all of that uh, in the beginning of the 1950s, that is less than 10 years after the end of the, the Second World War. And then gradually things evolved, uh, well gradually actually quite quite fast. Uh, you had the community, European community of coal and steel in, if I'm not mistaken, 1952. Uh, you had an attempt of creating uh, uh, a European defense community uh, one year later, but that was uh, rejected by the French Assemblée Nationale and uh, as a result of the, the French rejection, uh, the word defense, the concept of defense as being part of uh, the European construction remained taboo for about 30 years. And nobody would ever mention issues of, of defense uh, or would ever point to, to, to military aspects that was 
left to, to NATO if, if the states were members of NATO, but the six ones I mentioned were. Or else you had uh, other ones who uh, chose to uh, remain, remain neutral. Uh, then the European Economic Community was created and those were already in 1956 by the Treaty of Rome uh, renamed European Communities with a plural S uh, and then uh, gradually uh, there were uh, enlargements of the Union first with uh, uh, neighboring countries of the six I, I, I mentioned. Uh, the first three to join were uh, uh, the United Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland and the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, Norway uh, had also negotiated but the Norwegian population rejected joining uh, the communities by referendum. Uh, that was, I'm now referring to uh, the, the late the to the 70s, the early part of the 70s, first half. And then uh, after Spain, Portugal and Greece liberated themselves from uh, authoritarian right-wing dictatorships, uh, they also started negotiations, or the EU started negotiations with them, and they were the second batch of countries joining uh, the Union, Spain, Portugal and, and Greece. Uh, the motivation being at least as much political as economic and, and the motivation even being more political than economic is something we tend to forget. Uh, but Spain had lived for uh, over 19, 40 years under dictatorship. Franco. Uh, Portugal had even lived longer on under uh, dictatorship because that was established in the, in the tw 1920s. Greece uh, had uh, lived for about 10 years under military dictatorship and when those countries liberated themselves and uh, uh, became democracies again uh, it, it was found that it would be wise to uh, take them up uh, as members of the European family. So that was the, the second batch of uh, enlargement then, uh, of countries. Then you had a third batch that joined uh, slightly later, being Sweden, Finland and Austria. Uh, and by then we are in the 80s. Uh, and then you have uh, the collapse of the, the wall in, in 89, the reunification of, of Germany and uh, the countries in, in Eastern and Central Europe uh, liberating themselves from authoritarian communist rules one by one, which led to the start of accession negotiations, uh, which on average have lasted at least 10 years. It's something which is often forgotten. This has been a long process. This has been an arduous process, a process of uh, legislative and judicial approximation, uh, a process by which uh, the negotiating the states, the candidate states, uh, have to adopt, transpose and uh, implement all of the EU laws and, and uh, legislation and, and regulation. Uh, as to this day, uh, the whole of your EU legislation and regulation must be somewhere between uh, 150,000 and 200,000 pages. Uh, when I studied EU law in, in the 70s, it was a slim booklet was very easy, but uh, it has become much more complicated uh, since then. So that was the, the, the greatest uh, enlargement with uh, first uh, 15 and then two extra member states, so that now we are with 27 and last week in the European Parliament we approved uh, the uh, adhesion of Croatia, so Croatia uh, will soon become the 28th member state of uh, the Union. <coughs> and 
uh, we are there are there is a process of negotiation with Turkey, but that has stalled for the time being uh, because a number of member states don't want it to continue, uh, which in my view is a, a, a tragic mistake. So I hope they will change their mind because it uh, would be very important, I believe, that Turkey would uh, become a member of the, the Union, as well as the countries in, in the Western Balkans, uh, countries that are still uh, quite far from fulfilling all the necessary uh, legal and political conditions, but are in f to various degrees on their way, so that it can be expected that, let's say, by 2020-2025, they will all be members of the Union, which means, in my view, that the Union will still continue to, to exist. I'm very convinced of that. Now, as I said in, at the beginning, uh, culture and, and education weren't really uh, on part of, of the, the package of areas uh, in which uh, the European Union and the Member States uh, were willing to engage together. On the contrary, culture and education, and certainly culture, were explicitly excluded from the early stages because, as I said, the member states considered that uh, this was really their own domain and it is only via uh, the progress or the advancement of talks in the framework of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade uh, that culture or cultural products came to the fore. That is one element and it was also realized uh, quite uh, early on that educational exchange uh, was going or should play an important role. First, educational exchanges within and among member states, and that was the Erasmus program, uh, which allows university and high school, university and post-secondary students to study one or two semesters in uh, a university or a high uh, post-secondary institu educational institution in another member state. And then this scheme was enlarged to uh, the candidate countries and, and, and even beyond. And today, uh, several tens of thousands of, of young people have benefited and are benefiting from this and have studied one or two semesters in other universities in other member states uh, and, and generally uh, in other languages than their own uh, mother tongue. <coughs> Another cultural initiative which developed early on uh, is the, 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 the initiative of proclaiming some cities as cultural capitals of Europe for a year. And uh, this has become a, a quite competitive uh, thing countries, uh, or rather cities, really competing uh, in order to be uh, selected first by their own government, to be presented as one of the candidates for cultural capital of Europe, and then uh, within, the I believe it's the cultural committee of the parliament that uh, makes uh, the final decision. All the while, until uh, until the 80s, the European Union had, had no foreign policy as such. Foreign policy was considered to uh, be a, a, a monopoly of the member states. Which does not mean that the European Union had no foreign or external action as such. The Union did, for instance, uh, Development aid clearly is an external action 
and, and is, is an important one. Uh, trade neg in worldwide trade negotiations uh, are also a form of external action. Um, when agreements are to be negotiated uh, in, for instance, in, in uh, United Nations agencies, whether it is the, the urban, uh, urban rather, uh, agreement or uh, agreements in, uh, in the framework of the, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Tesaurus, for instance, uh, and, and other examples, uh, the Union negotiates on behalf of the Member States, at least certainly for trade uh, and for agriculture. Uh, now it has been, since the last treaty change, uh, agreed that uh, the Union also negotiates on behalf of the Member States uh, in, in other fields as well. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that does include uh, the, the environment, uh, although that is a difficult issue because Member States want to keep their own say. And uh, cooperation in the field of uh, foreign policy and foreign and security policy was only uh, written into the treaties in the 90s, that is, uh, barely 20 years ago. And that is the start of traditional foreign policy by the institutions of the European Union on behalf of the European Union. Uh, but originally, mostly on the basis of strict unanimity, that is, all the member states must agree uh, upon an initiative before it can be taken, before it can be developed. Uh, that rule has been uh, loosened in the sense that uh, since the uh, the Nice Treaty, that, that was the one just before Lisbon, it became possible in the field of security and defense for member states to launch uh, a, a joint action in a third state uh, under the rule that nobody has vetoed it. So you no longer need the express approval of each and every member state. It is sufficient that you have a qualified majority and that the others abstain without expressing a will to block or to veto the action that is under consideration. And an example of that is the EU Lex mission in Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo today has not been recognized by uh, all uh, EU member states, by 22 of them. Five of them have not yet done so. In spite of the fact that not all member states did recognize the independence of Kosovo, there a huge uh, EU mission in the fields of uh, the judiciary, the police and customs was deployed in Kosovo. It is uh, known as EU Lex uh, because no member state opposed the action. Not all of them expressly approved it, but none opposed it. So it was set up and it is still functioning and what is even uh, more uh, noticeable, some of the member states who have not recognized the independence of Kosovo have nevertheless sent people to work in uh, the, the, the different services of EU Lex in Kosovo. So, so that's the situation we, we are in. Foreign policy is, in, is emerging as a major policy field of the European Union. Security and defense in the, the military sense of the word is also a very new development of the Union. Uh, it, did not, it, it didn't belong to 
the competences of the Union until the second half of the 90s. And since uh, the year 2002, uh, the European Union has deployed over 22 missions in third countries. Those missions are either, uh, but that is seldom the case, they are generally essentially civil missions or mixed civil military missions and very seldom exclusively military missions. They are deployed at the demand or at the request or with the approval of the United Nations Security Council as a rule. Uh, they are generally temporary, uh, but some of them have ongo been ongoing for, for quite a long time. Uh, if you consider the EU presence in Bosnia-Herzegovina, for instance, or the EU presence in Kosovo, uh, these are examples of uh, uh, missions that have been long ongoing. So all of this is in, in full development. Some of it is, is in, in the very early stages, uh, and, and that probably uh, explains why <coughs> excuse me, there hasn't been priority attention to cultural uh, diplomacy as such, uh, because we are uh, busy developing diplomacy to court in, in the more traditional uh, sense of, of, of the word. Now, we have had for a long while a, a Directorate General for Cultural Affairs, but then mainly cultural exchanges among and between member states and uh, encouragement to uh, cultural initiatives in which, for instance, cultural institutions from more than, I believe, the minimum is three, of minimum three member states cooperate. This has been ongoing for uh, quite a while. Uh, you know that one of my, my colleagues uh, and a colleague from my own political group from ALDE, Marietje Schaak, Schaake, is the author of a, an important uh, report on cultural diplomacy. Uh, but she will address you, I believe, in the next few days. So I think it's only fair uh, that I would let her uh, present to you uh, her own text and, and her own proposals and not take away uh, uh, the primeur, as I say in French, that that would be unfair. But there's one initiative that she uh, proposes and which I want to highlight because I consider it to be very important. Uh, not that the other ones are, are unimportant, but that one is really important in my, in my view. She proposes that the European Union would also institute a form of cultural visas. We uh, have in, in our visa system special regulations for uh, student visa, uh, we have special regulations for business uh, visa, uh, but we don't have uh, anything similar or comparable for cultural visas. And it would, be, I believe, be very important if uh, artists uh, of all ages uh, would be able to, to benefit from such a system and if it was easier for um, artists from, from third countries to come uh, to a, a, a one or, or all member states either for a period of working in residence in one of them or for uh, the realization of uh, specific projects uh, or, or just for to come and perform in, in uh, member states. It is too often very difficult uh, for uh, artists to obtain such visa and, and I've known examples of, of music concerts that had to be cancelled uh, because uh, the, the musicians hadn't obtained uh, their visa in, in, in time. Uh, it's quite shameful that this happens and uh, 
uh, I believe that this would be a, a, a very uh, important uh, element. Allow me to say a few things about history to conclude and then to engage in, in debate with you because I would like to hear from you and to learn from you what your views are. Uh, Mr. Lagrou has said uh, earlier this, this morning that uh, he, he, believe, uh, he believes we are wrong to, to turn too much to history and, and he, he is right uh, in, if he means by that that we should not let ourselves be defined by our history. And he said that he, he didn't very well understand uh, the whole debate that had taken place when uh, the last treaty was uh, being discussed and when there was a whole debate about uh, on the preamble of uh, this treaty because this pre preamble was meant to brush a, a backdrop of the cultural, intellectual uh, and other elements of our common uh, history, identity, whatever you want to call it. And it, it was supposed to be an uplifting and uh, supposed to be an exalting text. And the actual debate <coughs> was about the desirability or not of uh, mentioning the Christian heritage uh, of Europe. And uh, the parties that uh, call themselves and that are Christian wanted such a, a reference to be made. The Catholic Church wanted such a reference to, to be made uh, and others uh, very much opposed uh, the whole idea. Uh, among those others, I was one. Uh, because, I mean, my own constitution, which was uh, first drafted in 1831, doesn't uh, make that kind of reference to, to the Catholic Church uh, or to any other church. Uh, my own constitution since 1831 says that religion in Belgium is free, so you can practice whatever you want as long as you don't harm anybody else, of course. And uh, I considered that it would have been kind of a, a regress to, to now, in, in the EU text, have this, this reference that we've never had in our own uh, constitution. But in other constitutions, reference is made to the religion. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, Sweden, until recently, in its constitution had a reference to the state religion, etc., uh, etc. Et so it was a huge debate. And it, it was not just about the past. But anyway, uh, I agree with Mr. Lagro that uh, it would be more interesting if we were able to agree on what we want to achieve or where we want to go in the future than on agreeing on what is our common past. Uh, or what we would like to see mentioned under that heading, common past. But that does not mean that we should neglect history. Because history has a way of coming back with a vengeance when you do ignore it. And I believe that it is important that we should uh, be able to arrive at a, a common approach of European history. Uh, it's not, it's, it is underway and it's not an easy effort uh, because whenever you will, for instance, evoke a battle, uh, the army of the one country that, that, that was the victor, okay, they were the victors and the others were defeated. So uh, there's no easy way to approach this and, and in our respective history lessons we have learned that our ancestors won in such and such a battle and lost in such and such 
another one, etc., etc. Uh, but that that shouldn't be the the, the essence. The essence should be uh, a description of of what has happened and and try to agree on that. Um, it is, for instance, not very reassuring that uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina you have three different kind of history textbooks. Uh, a Croat one, a Bosniak one, and, and a Serb one. I mean, that, that's absolutely not encouraging. And uh, similar situations exist elsewhere in Europe. And, and that is why it should be important if we could arrive at uh, a common uh, approach or a common description of what has actually happened which is different from a common interpretation of what has actually happened. And uh, respect for facts of history, I believe, is, is, is important and, and is uh, uh, an important element of, uh, of cultural sensitivity. And it is also important to be sensitive to the fact that uh, a given historical event may not be seen in the same way uh, by different people, people, sorry, diff people belonging to different cultures, uh, depending on what the event was. We should not be surprised that uh, the Crusades uh, to, to liberate uh, the holy sites in Jerusalem uh, are viewed very differently in the Arab world than they are viewed in the West. Uh, we should be aware of that and we should be sensitive to, the, of, to, to that. The same for colonialism, uh, etc., etc. But it can it cannot be ignored. It should not be wiped under the carpet. Uh, it, it must be possible to come to a, a common uh, acknowledgement of what the facts have been, and then to proceed from there. Uh, I believe that that is important, and that it is important to. Uh, work uh, on, on a common future. I would like to leave it at that and, and I'll give the floor to you for whatever questions and remarks or criticism uh, you may have. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for the excellent lecture and uh, be pleased to turn it over to your questions and comments. Who would like to go first, please? And if you could also introduce yourself, as always. Ladies first. Yeah. I'm Marina. I'm a student, a law and political science student, and my question is really simple. I just want to know the reason why you think uh, Turkey has to be a member of the UN. Thank you very much. Can we collect a few questions, maybe, together? Uh, okay? Yes, OK. Yeah? I believe yeah. two or three. I thought there was another question there, please. Uh, you mentioned a number of EU member states don't want to continue with the integration process. But my question is, what to do about the UK, Denmark, and Sweden? I saw this morning on BBC that they plan on having a referendum on any treaty changes. And they also um, expect to renegotiate and pull Britain or the UK out of certain aspects of the European Union. Um, what do you, how do you feel about that? And do you think that some states should have uh, partner states or affiliate states or something outside of the EU, but s still closely connected to it, so the uh, rest of the EU can further integrate? Is there a third question or comment? OK, please. Yes, hello. Uh, could you describe in what we call headlines called 2010 where we are in the research of synergy between civil capacity and military capacity, and where cultural diplomacy is, uh, is situated in this, um, in this big uh, research. Thanks. Yeah. So please, if you could respond to the, the questions, that would be great. So um, 
Firstly, I, I want to see Turkey enter the European Union we, because we promised her that she could one day in, since 1963 and we should uh, honor our own commitments, that, that, that is one reason. A second reason is because Turkey is an absolutely key country, uh, not only in, in the region, in the broad sense of the world, the word, uh, but, but for the entire continent. And uh, I, I much prefer Turkey to be a, a member of the European Union than uh, see Turkey um, join a, a, another grouping of, of, of nations which, which might one day uh, emerge. Uh, so that's a, 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 a very ordinary, uh, I am conscious of that geopolitical argument. Uh, I prefer to have them with them than to have, to have them with me than, than outside. Uh, the club, but I consider it it's a major it's a major country in its own right. Uh, it's a very large country. It is uh, doing very well economically. Uh, we are there as as a, a union. We are their first uh, business and commercial partner, and uh, they have a young population. And uh, we we it would be very well very good if they joined. These are all uh, very good reasons. And finally, um, if we continue to keep Turkey at bay, uh, I'm quite convinced that the rest of the Muslim world will believe that the main reason for we, us doing so is because the population of Turkey is in majority Muslim. And this will not co contribute to a better understanding worldwide. It would be and, and one more reason is Turkey is a democracy. It's not a perfect democracy, but it's improving steadily. Uh, it has, for instance, abolished the death penalty uh, several years ago. Uh, it has uh, reduced the inf very much the influence of the military in its political uh, operations uh, and uh, all those uh, and it, it, it is demonstrating that uh, Islam and democracy are compatible. And uh, those are reasons why I am in favor to the contrary of your neighbor who is uh, saying no. Well, that's, I'm sorry about that, but uh, these are my opinions. Um, the gentleman referred to the news of the BBC. Uh, well, I, I must honestly say that the news about the European Union on Anglo-Saxon media, uh, be they television or, or newspapers, is extremely discouraging. Uh, it's as if they can't wait for the Union to fall apart. And uh, I mean, not all of them, of course. One shouldn't generalize, uh, but, but several of them. And uh, some of them really absolutely gloat you have British journalists on BBC, on Sky, absolutely gloating at, at the problems of, of the European Union. And uh, I mean, it's disgraceful for some, how some of them are behaving, as we know British journalists have behaved disgracefully. Not all of them, but some have behaved disgracefully in other respects as well. For instance, concerning the respect for privacy and uh, human dignity, now, to come to your question, um, a, a treaty would need, uh, or a change to the treaty would need to be sub subjected to a referendum according to the, the constitutions of a number of member states, which uh, make, uh, make such a, a treaty change very complicated because it is to be expected that some of them uh, would uh, the populations in some of them would probably reject the changes, and then uh, we would not they, they could not reject the treaty as a whole. It would remain as it is. But uh, personally, I wouldn't run the risk of of having referenda right now. I mean, the, the juncture is too difficult. Uh, people have reasons to be upset. 
by uh, the necessary austerity measures, etc., etc. Uh, and, and I won't say nothing more about the British Conservative illusions of uh, uh, renegotiating the terms of their association uh, with, with the Union. Uh, I believe it is extremely ill-inspired and I personally don't believe in kind of a third status. Uh, le I mean, less than, than full membership, but more than, than being complete outside. As far as I'm concerned, you're a member of the club or you're out of the club. But there should be no such thing as being a, a member of the club, having all the benefits and none of the inconvenience. That shouldn't work. And, and I, I have a British colleague who, who believes this, this should be done. And I think it would be a, a mistake. You're either in or you're out. Uh, uh, sir, you, you asked questions about the cultural dimension of, of civil and, and military missions. Um, I don't know by heart the, the proportion of re civil respectively uh, mixed mi missions. I would say that uh, do you, do, the big majority of them are mixed, both civil and military. When I say civil, this means generally missions of helping to do uh, uh, to rebuild the judiciary and and the police. So uh, it is civil in the sense that it is not military, but it has to do with the exercise of, of some kind of force and, and ensuring public security. Um, the sensitivity to uh, cultural aspects has been growing. Uh, as its importance was gradually becoming more and more clear. Uh, when the very first uh, missions were deployed, as they say, out of theatre, uh, nobody was very much aware of the complexity of, of the situation uh, uh, one might en encounter. And uh, so this sensitivity has been, been growing absolutely uh, because uh, it has been understood that, well, if you're un un insensitive to that uh, you're getting nowhere, and uh, so it has been grown. All right, well, on that note, I think we should uh, conclude the session, but thank you very much for an excellent lecture, uh, as well as uh, for your perspectives. So you could please join me in thanking once again Ms. Anna-Maria Nettes-Utterbrook. Thank you. Thank you.